reigning superstar of the prehistoric world is the giant Brontosaurus. First discovered in the Wild West, no other monster could have been more misunderstood. But now, scientists have put a new face on this ancient beast and dramatically altered its public image. One hundred fifty million years ago, North America literally trembled under the weight of a leviathan called Brontosaurus. One of the largest land animals that ever lived, it could arch its neck over a three-story building. Four times heavier than an elephant, its legs were as huge as tree trunks. First discovered over a hundred years ago, Brontosaurus is one of the most popular dinosaurs in the world and the most misunderstood. Long depicted as dim-witted, lumbering, and lethargic, Brontosaurs were so big, scientists thought they needed the buoyancy of water to support their massive bodies. And the confusion doesn't stop there. Although they are sauropods, a family of docile plant eaters, almost everything else we know about them is wrong. Even their name. Their scientific name is actually Apatosaurus. One of the first to put the lie to their public image, maverick paleontologist Bob Barker, believes it's time to give Brontosaurus a makeover for the 90s. Brontosaurus, a Jurassic celebrity, the most famous plant-eating dinosaur, I grew up with it, and there are lots and lots of images of Brontos you can get at the toy store, kind of like this one. It's a certain plastic insouciance. That's a keeper. Uh, this is a dead loss. This is really awful. Necks wrong, heads wrong, bodies wrong, clothes are wrong, bumps are wrong, tails wrong. Lose that. This one really, really irritates me because um, it's more accurate than the others, but this is sold in museum gift shops. It should be even better. The neck should be much, much wider and uh, the feet are shaped differently here. <sighs> You've got to unlearn a lot of what you thought you knew about Brontosaurus. And we're going to start with the head because there's nearly everything wrong with the head and this one really irritates me. Feel better now. <laughs> The head of Brontosaurus has been a bone of contention for the past century. The debate started way back in the days of the Wild West, when Brontosaurus was first discovered. In the 1870s, as work gangs cut the Union Pacific Railroad through the American Midwest, they stumbled upon something unexpected. Come here! They found gigantic bones unlike anything they'd seen before. Some as tall as a man. The discovery was made near the town of Laramie, Wyoming, on a rocky outcrop called Como Bluff. One of the richest dinosaur graveyards in the world, it would yield the skeletons of dozens of new species and bones by the ton. More than enough to build this house, made of fossils, 145 million years old. The skeletons from Como Bluff sparked a frenzy for dinosaurs and launched the Great American Bone Rush. For anyone lucky enough to find an unknown monster and name it, fame and fortune was theirs for the taking. With each new discovery, word spread like wildfire. Got an urgent message to New York. Right away, sir. Back east, America's new museums were desperate to get hold of fossils. The bigger, the better. In 
In 1870, Yale professor O.C. Marsh arrived at Como Bluff, hoping to strike it rich and gain his place in the history books. For three years, through freezing winters and blistering summers, his team dug up bones from an area the size of a football field. When Marsh pieced them together, he realized it was a nearly complete skeleton of just one animal. It was also the largest dinosaur yet discovered. He christened it Thundering Lizard, or Brontosaurus. There were 120 bones in all, but a vital piece was missing, its head. <laughs> As the fossils were being shipped back east, Marsh had a dilemma. Should he reconstruct Brontosaurus without a head, or take a guess? His reputation at stake, he decided to introduce Brontosaurus to the world, head and all. But what head? Conveniently, Marsh had discovered the skull of another sauropod, called Camarasaurus, from a different quarry at Como Bluff. In 1883, at the Peabody Museum at Yale, Marsh unveiled his Brontosaurus for the first time, complete with the head of Camarasaurus. In the rush to be first, mistakes were common. But Marsh's fateful decision would reverberate through the halls of paleontology for the next hundred years. Dinosaurs captured the world's imagination and turned Brontosaurus into an instant celebrity. O.C. Marsh basked in the glory of his famous monster, undaunted by the fact that its skeleton was incomplete, if not incorrect. But something was about to happen that would challenge his reputation. In 1909, near the little town of Jensen, Utah, fossil hunter Earl Douglas was collecting for the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh when he stumbled upon some colossal bones. The partially exposed segments of a dinosaur tail. They were buried just behind this hut where he stored his dynamite. Douglas eventually unearthed not only the most complete brontosaurus ever found, but as Scott Madsen explains, this time, the dinosaur kept its head. Of course, when Douglas was here, this rock outcrop actually stood about 50 feet higher than where I'm standing today. Those vertebrae were sitting at the top of that outcrop, and the rest of the tail would have extended down behind me about 30 or 40 feet, while the rest of the body was stretched out in this direction to somewhere in here where they found the skull attached to the skeleton. The skull Douglas found was long and slender, unlike the Camarasaurus skull Marsh had mounted on his Brontosaurus, which was bigger and snub-nosed. When word of the discovery leaked out, scientists dared the Carnegie Museum to exhibit it. In the paleo world of the turn of the century, O.C. Marsh's lofty reputation still carried weight. Under pressure, the museum didn't mount the Douglas skull on its skeleton. For the next 40 years, Brontosaurus appeared in public with the same skull Marsh had touted at Yale, until dinosaur expert Jack McIntosh decided something was wrong. When I first saw this head as a kid, it looked fine. But as I studied these animals more carefully, it became clear that this large snub-nosed skull was not the proper one for this animal. McIntosh's doubts were based on his intimate knowledge of another dinosaur called Diplodocus, a giant with a long, slender snout. Convinced that Brontosaurus looked more like Diplodocus than Camarasaurus, he set about solving the dilemma by delving into Douglas's original journals. I'm glad to announce that we have found dinosaur skulls. The skull seems pretty large to me, about 26 inches in length. A skull was found with the skeleton. In search of this skull, McIntosh headed deep into the bowels of the Carnegie Museum, where fossils not on display are stored. 
his chances looked slim. Tucked away in drawers, deep recesses, and murky corners are the remains of countless dinosaurs that ruled the prehistoric world, some still lying in state. Big bones are stored on shelves, labeled according to when and where they were found. McIntosh was looking for any sign of Douglas's 1909 expedition. At the back of the bone room, he finally found what he was searching for. Ah, uh, this was the defining moment. It was clear that this was Douglas's skull without the lower jaw, the right size, the, the long tapered snout without the bulldog-like short one of the camarasaur-like skulls that Marsh had assigned to this animal. In 1975, for the first time in its history, Jack McIntosh reunited Brontosaurus skeleton with its true head. Ah, that's fine. That's great. While museum curators and book publishers around the world scrambled to find a new head, all Jack had to do was to return the old one to the tomb of unclaimed bones. But the dinosaur's new profile was just the beginning. Its discovery would unleash a landslide of new revelations about Brontosaurus that would continue to change its celebrated image. The old Brontosaurus was depicted as a tall, upright creature towering over the treetops, feeding on tender leaves, much like giraffes do today. But now, in museums around the world, the image of Brontosaurus is undergoing a major makeover. Kent Stevens of the University of Oregon doesn't dig up bones like most paleontologists. He explores the world of dinosaurs with state-of-the-art technology. Using 3D computer animation, Stevens has demolished the theory of Brontosaurus as a lofty beast. I think we'd all like to imagine that this majestic beast was uh, walking along with his head held proudly high like this, munching off the trees, and maybe if it was underwater, still keeping its head above the water. Uh, Here's a, a different sauropod. This is the same animal, two radically different views on how much its neck could move. The old Brontosaurus had a shorter neck. The new version is longer, which limits how high the animal could carry its head. To calculate its range of motion, Stevens has reconstructed the neck of a Brontosaurus bone by bone. Well, the way I've been going about trying to do it is to use the computer as a means for modeling the geometry, modeling the exact shape of individual bones, and then putting them together, and then letting the, the shape of the bones limit the movement on a joint-by-joint -joint basis. To get the proper shape, every neck bone had to be accurately measured. Based on the measurements, a computer program called Dynomorph created a working model and tested it in an arching pose. If you put the dynamorph model into that pose, if you really try to do a replica of this real tall stance, you end up, in fact, breaking the neck in quite a few places. If Brontosaurus couldn't reach the treetops to feed, how and what did it eat? Well, why don't we imagine this popcorn is some tasty truffles and scattered about the Jurassic underbrush. And let's imagine this vacuum cleaner as the neck of the brontosaurus. Probably swept along in a sort of gentle arc back and forth, picking up what it could, stepping forward from time to time. Sort of a motion like this. So, in conclusion, the brontosaurus was probably feeding off of relatively low vegetation and nowhere near as high a vegetation as we were led to believe. Far from a heady life in the trees, brontosaurus was living off the land. But its head now seems far too small to consume the amount of food needed to sustain its massive body. Unless a vital piece of information is missing. Intrigued by the problem, Bob Barker decided to pay a new visit to an old friend. 
Alas, poor Brontosaur. I knew him well, Horatio. Well, that is my favorite plant-eating dinosaur, my favorite veggie-saur, my favorite dinosaur face, but it's a face full of problems. You can see where the eye goes, the ear, well, maybe the tongue. But what about the face? What about the expression? What about the lips? From this skull, you don't know anything about Bronto lips. You don't know whether you could be slurped by a Bronto. But we have a new skull, and it answers that question, the questions about Brontosaurian lips. In 1995, a team of excavators led by Bob Barker returned to Como Bluff in Wyoming, where O.C. Marsh first discovered Brontosaurus. At a site called Nail Quarry, the remains of giant dinosaurs are not unusual. But what they uncovered was a complete skull of a Brontosaurus, including, for the first time, the lower jaw. This skull led Barker to question his own preconceptions about how Brontosaurus looked. If you want to know about Bronto faces, and I do, you've got to start with the T-Rex, because it has primitive lips. It has what I call a garbo smile, thin, curved, and carnivorous. And we know that because of the lip holes in the skull. You've got a primitive dinosaur face, and there's a row of holes, bing, 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 meaning a row of nerves and a thin lip like that, like a lizard, and that's the way I've always drawn Brontosaurus with thin lizard lips. That's another possibility, really absurd, that Brontos had moose lips. I didn't believe that, no one did, and we were all wrong. Barker rarely admits he's wrong, but some features of the new skull changed his mind. Looking at it for the first time reminded him of a moose. Consider the moose. Huge muscular lips for grabbing plants and a gigantic hole here for one huge nerve going to the lips. Did Brontosaurus have a similar lip apparatus? Yes, it did. How do we know? The new skull, the first complete skull and lower jaws ever found for Brontosaurus right here. Complete lower jaw with teeth. Eardrum would be here. Eye socket there. The face. And right on the face was a gigantic hole for the lip, nerve, and artery. This hole is twice the size of the hole from a moose. Coming out of this hole was a gigantic nerve and artery supplying a super gigantic set of moose lips. And we now can reconstruct correctly the Bronto face. Skull. Muscles and nerves. Eyeball. Eardrum. They're the nerves for the lip. face. For the first time we see the real Brontosaurus face. With lips like this, it could pull off twigs. With lips like this, it could pick up nuts. With lips like this, it could slurp its young to reassure it. Brontosaurus had a magnificent, expressive, highly adaptive face with the biggest set of lips in all the dinosauria. The front of Brontosaurus is not all that's been revamped. Its rear has also taken a beating. For a long time, Brontosaurus was portrayed as the consummate tail dragger, a dinosaur so huge he could barely keep his backside off the ground. Later versions showed Brontosaurus horizontally balanced between his head and his tail. But Brian Curtis of State University of New York is still not sure that it's right. When I first saw this Brontosaurus toy, I said, ridiculous. There is no way Brontosaurus could hike up on its hind legs. But as I began to study the anatomy of this animal, I realized, yes, he could. What Curtis saw in Brontosaurus was that its hind legs are larger and longer than its forelimbs. In fact, the back half of its body is 30% larger than its front. Brontosaurus also sported the world's largest pelvis. This pelvis was so huge because of the amazing amounts of muscles attaching to it. This is evidenced by the tall spines and the huge muscles that run the, ran across the top of this animal's tail, and an equally large muscles that ran across the bottom of this animal's tail. These muscles converged on the pelvis and were anchored there, and when activated would pull Brontosaurus up onto his hind legs, with the tail then touching the ground, acting as a third limb. 
So, Brontosaurus could reach the treetops after all, but not by arching its neck. Instead, it stood on its hind legs, using its tail for support. The proof rests in the size of its large, triangular-shaped tailbones. This large hole in the center is for the arteries and veins and nerves to run through. The size of this hole and the size of these bones indicate the tail was immense. The shape of these bones was long thought to be unique to dinosaurs, but similar bones are still around today. Come on, boys. Come on out. Kangaroos use their tail as a third leg, just like Brontosaurus. Kangaroos have large pelvis, just like Brontosaurus. And kangaroos have chevron bones, just like Brontosaurus. Kangaroos can get up on their hind legs and get five feet in the air. Imagine how amazing Brontosaurus would have been, 35 feet in the air. But unlike kangaroos, Brontosaurus packed a secret weapon. The massive muscles that heaved it up on its hind legs also allowed Brontosaurus to crack its tail like a whip. The last 40 tailbones are only six inches long. Linking them by a ball and ball attachment gives the tail its remarkable flexibility. A whip was a useful weapon when warding off a pack of hungry predators. Imagine this whip is the last 15 feet of the tail of Brontosaurus. The lack of broken bones in the tails that we find suggests the tail was not impacting its enemies. But what it could have done is this. Creating thunderous cracks, the tip of the tail exceeding 720 miles an hour, enough to scare any enemy away. From tail dragger to whip cracker, earth shaker to acrobat, Brontosaurus has undergone the greatest facelift in dinosaur history. Now, more than ever, the giant of giants deserves its celebrity status.